<laughs> all right, Psalm 103, 1 through 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his what? Benefits. Benefits. We're going to stop right there. Now you can one more time reach over take your neighbor by the hand. Just one more time. I know, I know. Father, again, we thank you for your presence, Lord, and for the next few moments, we push everything to the side, every distraction, every hindrance, and we ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts today. We're here because we want to hear from you, Holy Spirit. So have your way today, Lord. I pray that as I release what you've put on the inside of me, I know, Lord, it's going to go forth like an arrow and pierce each heart that's in here, each person watching online. So, Lord, have your way today. I want you to take a moment and just take a deep breath. Say, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me today. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Father. We love you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. 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 You can be seated. Sit back, relax. I'm going to go to work. You ready? Yeah. All right. Are you growing? Yes. Amen. I know you are. That's awesome. Yes. Amen. So go ahead. Give the Lord praise. <laughs> That's awesome. We are growing. So what I want to do today is we're going to do a little bit of review first, and then we're going to get into the finished work of Jesus. For the last three Sundays, we've talked about our response to what grace has made available. So I want you to say this with me. Say, faith is my positive response. Faith is my positive response. So what is my assignment as a believer? Here's your assignment. Respond to everything that grace has made available. That's your, that's your responsibility, all right? That's your assignment. Your job is not just to come to church and listen, and listen to a sermon as good as that is. Your job is to respond to what you're hearing. Does that make sense? And that response is your faith. Just say faith response. Faith response. James chapter 2 verse 17 says, faith without works is dead. That word works means corresponding action. So your faith without a corresponding action, that faith is dead. So you have to do something with that faith that you have. Somebody say amen. amen. So I want to just ask you, what is the difference between the world and a Christian? A response. What's the difference between a believer who's on their way to heaven and a person who's lost and is on their way to hell? The only difference is one response. I believe in Jesus as my Savior. Are you getting this? My faith is a response. It's so important that we understand this. Salvation has been made available to the entire world, but the whole world has not responded. So the first response that we talked about was a relational response. We respond now out of relationship. It's not just something we're taught, a formula, this is what you have to do, but it's out of my relationship with God, I now respond to what he's given me. And our second response is we have to know that God loves us. And that's what we talked about just a little bit ago. You have to know God, just say this, say God loves me. me. Now elbow your neighbor and say, he really loves me. (laughs) I'm serious, you gotta know that. You have to know that. Because when you know that, it creates effortless faith. I'm not trying to get God to move. He loves me, amen? And then last week, we focused on rest. When we're confident in the fact that it's done, we can rest. So a great way way to check our faith is, am I at rest? Am I resting in the finished work of Jesus? If we're worrying, striving, toiling, trying to make things happen, we're not at rest. So we've looked at some of our responses, but now I want to take a closer look at the finished work of Jesus. We're learning how to respond, but... Now I want you to see what, our, what we're responding to. This is so important, because I can talk about the finished work of Jesus, we can get excited, but if we don't know what we're talking about, it's not going to do us any good, right? Now you might be thinking today, Joe, we've looked at these scriptures before, and yes, we have, but you're soon going to figure out that I have one sermon, it's about three years long, and the title is Jesus. <laughs> That's all I preach, amen? I think I've heard some of this before. Yeah, you have. Psalm 103, 1 through 2. 1 and 2. Nope, go back, and then we'll get to 3. Who's back there? Oh, Adrian's back. (laughs) Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And then we're commanded, don't forget his benefits. There are benefits to being in the family of God. Amen? Verse 3. Here we go. Who forgives all your iniquities, and we're going to stop right there. The other one's good too, but that'll probably be next week. Who forgives all your iniquities? You have to get this nailed down as a believer that you're forgiven. Just say, I'm forgiven. forgiven. Say it again. Say, I'm forgiven. forgiven. 
So what we're going to do today is just take a deep dive into the Word of God and see what it says. And I'm warning you, almost every time I talk about the forgiveness of sins, somebody gets healed. They, they just go together. Healing and forgiveness of sins, they go together. So look at your neighbor and say, it might be me. Somebody's, somebody's going to get healed. It just happens when you talk about this. Now, I say the finished work of Jesus all the time, so I want you to know exactly what, what I'm talking about, and I want you to be able to explain it. Because it's not good enough that you have it up here. You need it in your heart. So when you talk to somebody, it just spills out. In other words, where, if you're cut somewhere, you ought to bleed the gospel. Because I'm so full of the word. Amen? Amen. All right, let's begin in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We could stay here all day. Who did the blessing come from? God the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Who has blessed us. All the English lovers, what tense is has? Past. All right? Past tense. So is God getting ready to bless you? Fixing to bless you, fitting to bless you. No, he's not getting something ready. Who has blessed us? He's already blessed you. Just say that. Say, he's already blessed me. This is one of the things, this is one of the responses. We have to know he's already blessed you. Who has blessed us? He's not getting ready to when you get your life right. He's not getting ready to when you start coming to church every week and you don't miss a Sunday. He's not getting ready to when you, are you with me? He has blessed us. Now, when you understand that, then it changes everything you do. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm getting excited. Sorry. If it's past tense, then it means that it's done. So what has he blessed us with? Every spiritual blessing. Just say every. Every. Every spiritual blessing. So God didn't pick and choose. You can have this one. That one's not for Al. And you can have this one. What does it say? Every spiritual blessing. Every blessing. It's done. Just say it's done. That means that Jesus gave it all. He gave it all for you. Now, it's important to understand that every physical blessing first begins in the spirit realm. So don't get confused when it it says spiritual blessing because some people say, well, that doesn't mean healing. That doesn't mean finances because that's spiritual. Your financial blessing first begins in the spirit before you ever see it in the physical Your healing, your physical healing begins in the spirit before you ever see it in the physical, in the natural. Does that make sense? So don't get confused with that. Your joy begins in the spirit, your peace. Amen? So where are the spiritual blessings? Who has blessed us, past tense, with every spiritual blessing? So whenever Christ died and gave us all of these things, died for us and grace provided this, and he provided every spiritual blessing, where's the spiritual blessing? In heavenly places. places. Where are heavenly places? Where's Christ? On the inside of us. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing. The spiritual blessings are in heavenly places. Heavenly places are in Christ. And now Christ has taken up residence on the inside of the believer. That means that you are walking around with the answer to every problem that you will ever face. It's on the inside of you. Does that make sense? Let's look at this again. Spiritual blessings are in heavenly places. Heavenly places are in Christ. Christ is now on the inside of me. Isn't that awesome? Is that what the word says? That's what it says. Now, if that is true and we know it is, how do I respond to it? That's the question. How do I respond to this? Who has blessed me with every spiritual blessing? You have to believe that. God has blessed me with every spiritual blessing. The blessings are in heavenly places. Heavenly places are in Christ. Christ is now on the inside of me. So I have the answer on the inside of me. How do I respond with using my faith? Everybody say faith response. response. All right, so let's keep going. John chapter 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. What does it say? All. All things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop or hyssop and and put it, put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Knowing that all things were now accomplished, he says, it is finished. I looked up that word all in the Greek. You know what it means? All. (laughs) 
I know it sounds... <laughs> that was deep, wasn't it? <laughs> I learned some Greek today and <laughs> some Hebrew. I know it sounds funny for us to even go over this, but there are Christians who still don't believe in the finished work of Jesus. They'll sing about it like we just did. Jesus paid it all, but they really don't believe. Some believe that he provided salvation, but he didn't provide healing. There are Christians like that. You'll get healed when you die and go to heaven. Man, can I meddle a little bit? If you believe like that, then death is your savior, not Jesus. Ouch. All right, I'm going to keep going. Some believe he provided salvation and healing, but nothing for my finances. You just got to be broke. Jesus was poor and he was broke. You got to be like that. And they need to read their Bibles. Amen? I'm not being mean. I'm just being real with you. It clearly says Jesus, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he said it's finished. He didn't leave one thing out. All things are accomplished and he sealed it with, it is finished. This is why we call it the finished work of Jesus. He said it's done. It's accomplished. It's finished. I'm not being mean, but if we called it what some people believe, we would say the halfway done work of Jesus. I'm serious. The not quite finished work, because he needs a little bit of your help. The still working on it gospel. <laughs> no. <laughs> what does the word of God say? It is finished. And Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he took care of it. Amen? Amen. If we don't believe that it's completely finished, then we can't receive this, this, I don't know, I'm, this is just good stuff. Are you all right? Yeah. If I don't believe, if I only believe, I go to a church that only believes in salvation but not healing and prosperity, I guarantee I won't walk in healing and prosperity. Why? We don't believe it. I believe in a church, or I go to a church that only believes in salvation and healing. I might receive salvation and healing, but I'm not going to be blessed financially because we don't believe. So I have to know in my heart, everything is finished. He provided it all for me. Somebody say Amen. amen. See, if we don't believe that it's completely finished, I can't receive. So I have to know that it is finished. It's the finished work, and now my faith positions me to receive what he's done. What is it when we don't fully believe? Unbelief. That's the sin that cannot be forgiven. Unbelief. You have to believe in Jesus as your Savior. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes you have to believe that's the only sin that can't be forgiven it's a sin of unbelief it's powerful all right are you with me this is why i keep reinforcing this you have to believe you have to believe and when you believe on jesus as your savior boom you're good amen john 17 verse 4 i got to keep moving i have glorified you on the earth i have red letters i have finished the work which you have given me to do just say it's finished Jesus himself says, Father, I have finished the work. And there's other scriptures we could look at, but you're getting the point. It's done, right? So I'm not trying to get God to do something. He already did it. This is why I keep saying my faith now moves me into a position to receive the finished work. It's done. Now let's go back to Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgives all your iniquities. There's that word all. Iniquities is immoral behavior. He, you're forgiven. I told you there are certain things that you have to know, that you have to have nailed down, and that that knowing, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is actually your positive response. You knowing that, that I'm forgiven, that's your positive response. Here's one that we have to have nailed down. Let's put that up there. Sin has been paid in full. You have to know this in your heart. Let's read that together. Sin has been paid That's awesome. This is one of, this is my positive response. I have to know the sin issue is taken care of. It's done. 1 John 4.10. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now the next one, 1 John 2, verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The word propitiation right there has different meanings because some people, they use it to refer to regaining favor with false gods. And that's not what this means. So when we put it into the context of scripture, we could say it means payment or compensation. Okay, that's what propitiation means, payment or comp compensation. 
you have to know this. Jesus is an overpayment for your sins. He is an overpayment for your sin. Jesus was not sent to make the payment. Jesus is the payment. Look at your neighbor and say, he is the payment. payment. Amen. Here's where a person who understands grace, this is where our thinking has changed. I no longer focus on sin. I look at the overpayment. Are you getting it? I'll give you an example. Of course, this is, it's hard to compare what Jesus did for us, but this will help you, I think. Let's say that you owe someone $10,000 in three days, and you just lost your job, and you can't sell anything to get the money. You're really hurting. You don't know how you're going to get this paid off. You're totally broke. No hope of paying this debt. In three days, you have to come up with $10,000. Now, how do you act? You're discouraged. Your head's hung low, right? Walking around. You don't want to go out in public. You don't want to run into anybody and talk to them. And then I hear about your debt. And I say, you know what? I'm going to take care of that. But I'm not going to pay the $10,000. I'm going to pay $10 million. How many know that's an overpayment? And you're like, whoa. Thanks, Joe. (laughs) I'm totally in the clear. That's what Jesus did for you. He was an overpayment for your debt of sin. He didn't just pay your debt. He overpaid. He took care of the sin issue forever. Now when you see the person that you owed $10,000 to, you don't hide. You don't freak out. You're like, see ya. Why? You're in the clear. It was an overpayment, amen? Amen. Now you say, Joe took care of me. He paid more than enough. I'm clear. You don't have to keep wondering if that $10,000 debt is going to come up again. Why? There was a huge overpayment. Are you seeing this? Now a weight has been lifted off of your shoulders. You can walk around enjoying life because you don't focus on the $10,000 anymore. The debt, you focus on the $10 million overpayment. I'm preaching now. Don't miss this. Are you with me? When we come to church, we are taught, focus on the $10,000 debt. Sin, 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 and you're not doing that right, and you're not doing that right. And brother, you need to get that right. I can tell right now. You need to get down to the altar and repent and get right with the Lord. What are we doing? We're looking at the $10,000 debt. Preachers and pastors ought to be bringing up the overpayment. Jesus died in my place. Amen? Amen. Point to three people tell them that's grace. That's grace. Jesus paid it all, amen? He was an overpayment for your debt of sin. So now we don't have to walk around in fear and condemnation with our heads hung low, amen? I can walk around with my head held high, enjoying life and everything he's given me. People who understand the gospel of grace and believe in the finished work of Jesus, they don't focus on the debt, they focus on the overpayment. That's the difference. John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the what? He didn't just take care of your sins. He took care of the sins of the entire world. We think too small because we say things like, I don't know how he could ever forgive me. Oh, Joe, you don't know what I did. I've really done some awful things. I've destroyed families. I've messed up way too much to be forgiven. I know we've all had thoughts like that, but... Are you kidding me? <laughs> Who took care, took away the sin of the world? If he took away the sin of the world, I think you're covered. Amen. Do you see the overpayment? Because we look at our $10,000 debt and we say, man, that is so huge. You don't understand what I've done in my life. You don't understand the sins that I've committed. Instead of looking at the overpayment. When he died, he took care of the sins of the entire world. All they have to do now is use their faith as a positive response and believe in Jesus as my Savior, and they receive that overpayment. Are you getting it? So good. Do you understand the overpayment? If he took care of the sins of the entire world, I think you're going to be all right. Amen? Mark ten forty five. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He didn't pay the ransom. Jesus was the ransom. Do you see how insulting it is to God when we don't believe what his Son did was enough? How it insults our Heavenly Father when we say, I don't know, you don't know what I did. 
and he's looking at the overpayment, saying, you're covered with your little measly $10,000 debt. I've paid all these millions of dollars, and you're worried about that little debt? Are you with me? I'm not being mean. I'm just, this is how I think. It's like, Lord, forgive me for even thinking so small. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world died in my place. Perfect, spotless Lamb. Somebody say amen. Amen. Point to three people, tell them he's enough. He's enough. Well, Joe, are you saying that because Jesus was an overpayment, I can go out and do whatever I want? No, you didn't hear me. (laughs) I'm saying that when you truly understand that Jesus was an overpayment, you won't go see what you can get away with. Luke 7, verse 47, New Living Translation. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. Red letters. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. When you understand that you've been forgiven much, you will love much. So instead of yelling at the congregation, you need to love God, you need to love God more, maybe we should be telling them you've been forgiven much. There was an overpayment. Jesus was the overpayment, amen? Amen. If I paid $10 million dollars, for your $10,000 debt, how would you feel about me? You'd say, there's my friend Joe, right? Come on over, we're going to cook out in the backyard, we're going to hang out, I'm going to get some steaks tonight, buddy, come on over. (laughs) I can't believe you'd do that for me. Joe, why would you do that? What made you step up for me? Why do you love me so much? Now what are you trying to do? You're trying to get to know my heart. What would cause you to do that for me? I owed 10000 over here to this guy, and you paid $10 million. Why would you overpay? I wanted to get to know you. See how the gospel's working? You, you, there were an overpayment for my life. So now I want to get as close as I can to the one who made the overpayment. Why did you love me so much that for my healing, they were beating your back and ripping the flesh off? Why did you... you any moment, you could have called 10,000 angels. You could have said, nope, that's too much. I'm out. And he stayed there for, how could you love me so much? I want to know your heart. How could you hang on the cross that whole time and never utter a word, never say, "Ah, I'm done, I'm out. Just hang there for me. How could you do that? I want to know your heart. Are you seeing this? People who really understand grace, it draws you closer to the one who made the overpayment. People who want to see what they can get away with, they really don't understand grace. Oh, he made an overpayment. Well, I'll see you later, man. So I owed $10,000 and you gave $10 million. I'll see you. Are you with me? They don't understand grace. When you really understand what Jesus has done, the finished work, it makes you want to get as close as you can to him. Somebody say amen. amen. So what do we do? We love because we've been forgiven much. That's why I say he's forgiven your past, your present, and your future sins. How many know that's much? This is what I used to wrestle with. How can he forgive your future sins? How many were in the future when he died on the cross? So he forgave all of your sins before you were born. He's just waiting on you to respond with your faith. So when you understand he's forgiven me for all of that, I'm in the clear. I love you. And if you're being real and honest, it's like, I want to get to know you. I want to know your heart. Because if that's what a good father is like, as a dad... I want to be like that. Are you catching this? Now I don't love because some preacher told me to. I love God because I understand the overpayment that was made for me. It's a whole different story. Amen? I want to, we have just a few minutes. I want to show you something. Hebrews chapter 10. We don't have this on the screen. I want to show you something really quickly. The sin issue has been taken care of. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 says, For the law having a shadow of of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer, continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. So they're offering sacrifices every year. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. He said, if the sacrifices that were offered every year, if they'd have taken care of everything, they they would have ceased to offer those. They wouldn't have had to offer them every year. For then, then those who approach, perfect. For then, let me get verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. 
But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away their sins. Well, I'm going to break this down. He's saying every time that in the Old Testament they had to come in and offer the sacrifice, every year covered their sins for an entire year. Everybody with me? You got that? He said if those sacrifices would have covered their sins forever, there would be no more consciousness of sin. What, what brought about the consciousness of sin? I've got to go back next year and ask forgiveness. I've got to go back and bring my sacrifice. Are you catching this? So Jesus says, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to accomplish everything. It is finished. It's done. I've taken care of it. So here's my question. Why does the church constantly think about sin? It clearly says, if the blood of bulls and goats would have taken away their sin forever and not just for one year, they would have had no more consciousness of sin. So why do I come to a church that says sin, 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 sin? You should come and say, Jesus was an overpayment. You're clear. And when you believe that with your heart, now your life begins to line up with that. Are you getting it? That's what changed my life. Changed my life forever. Okay, go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm finished. Every t- if you're a believer and Jesus is living on the inside of you and the enemy brings up your past and brings up your sin, it's a lie. It's a lie. You've been forgiven. You've been forgiven much. Now when you truly get this in your heart, and sometimes it takes a little while, but when you get this in your heart, you'll feel the chains come off like we sang about. Now I'm free. And then you don't even... It's hard to explain the... <laughs> But the easiest way I explain it is God flips a switch on the inside and now you, sin no longer has dominion over you. Because you're, you're no longer under the law. You're under grace. So the sin issue, once you understand it's been taken care of, I don't want to go see what I can get away with. It actually, there's like God flips a switch and sin begins to go. Whew. Why? The, if you understand that the sacrifice was enough, was an overpayment, I would have no more consciousness of sins. That's what it says in Hebrews 10, right? That's the word. That's not my opinion. That's what it says. So now if I believe he's an overpayment, he paid more than enough for the sins of the entire world, why do I keep focusing on sin? Are you getting this? And now sin can't control me anymore. The enemy can't control me. And you'll literally feel his grip loosen off of you.